The time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order, and I invite you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first school committee of the new session, and welcome to all of the new members. Five out of the seven uh, school committee members are here for the first time, their first meeting of the new term. Mr. Sullivan is uh, on his second tour of duty and has served uh, two terms previously, and Tim, welcome back. So uh, everyone will get to know each other real quickly. And uh, tonight is the organizational meeting, so a lot of what you're going to see tonight is, is pretty routine stuff in terms of the charter requires us to elect a secretary, elect a vice chair, um, assign subcommittee assignments, and, and handle the organizational uh, duties in order that we can then go forward for the next two years. So uh, bear with us. We do open each meeting. Uh, with hearing of visitors. Hearing of visitors is an opportunity for any member of the community to come forward and uh, bring an issue of interest or concern to the attention of the school committee, the mayor, and the superintendent of schools. Uh, it's, uh, the hearing of visitors is a three minute time limit for your comments and there's no response from the school committee. All matters brought forward during hearing of visitors are taken under advisement by the school committee. So the members of the committee will listen very carefully, um, but uh, under the rules and protocols of the school committee, uh, it's all matters are taken under advisement uh, that are brought to the committee's attention during the hearing of visitors. Uh, we have a sign-in sheet uh, that's available to the public right up until the start of the meeting. And we welcome visitors to join us for three minutes each in the order that they signed in on the sheet. So the first uh, visitor we'll welcome up to speak is Bradley Soufant. <laughs> How's everyone? I see some new faces. Uh, I'm badly, I'm badly so far for those who don't know me. And I would like to say something to you guys. Um, uh, you guys remember me from last year? Anyone remember me? Only two members returned from last year. Okay. Well, I'm going to just start it off with this. Can I take this off? No. No. Right. I came here today because we started a campaign last school year. I'm going to remind each and every one of the school committee members we are back to continue the push and movement to change the demerit system. Some of you guys may some of you guys may be shocked that we are still at it. Some of you guys might be angry or intimidated. But that's not my business. What is my business is the Yicks and Black Men High who feel as if the system is unfair. For those who don't know about Yick, it is an abbreviation for Young Inner City Kids. We are a movement of enlightened, educated youth who are unified to make our communities a better place. In Black Men High, we have many Yicks who feel as if the system has not really changed. Many years also stressed to me how it is still unfair. Now last year, many students came forward and petitioned for an alternative. That obviously did not matter to you guys. Hundreds of students walked out and protested for a change in our system, but that obviously didn't matter since Pluff Academy has also inherited the demand system. So what does that say to us students and citizens of Brockton? That our voices don't matter? Because last I recall, the citizens in the community should have a say on how the students get disciplined. With that being said, to everyone on the school committee, uh, 
to everyone on the school committee, expect the unexpected this year. Not only has our support grown 110%, but we are all ready to reach our goal by any means necessary. This year, we are ready to organize and work with anyone who is new to the chair, who is new to the school committee, and who wants to help us reach our goal. You guys have an obligation to the people. All of you guys. That's why you're here. You guys have an obligation to the people. And if students, not only students, but citizens, people who have graduated the school feel some type of way about the system, you guys are obligated to not only look, but look for an alternative as well. Do you guys understand me? Uh, am I being heard? Am I being heard? Am I being heard, guys? I'm going to leave it at that. But this is not the last you guys will be seeing of us. We'll be back and we'll be back. And like I said, whoever wants to build with us, we are going to be around. Okay? Thank you. officer and uh, would like to uh, just take a three minutes to bring the school committee uh, up to date on a program that's running next Tuesday, the showing of an independent film produced by the Wahlberg Foundation uh, to create awareness around the issue of prescription drug addiction in teenagers. So at that, Officer Liebberg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, on January 12th, which is Tuesday night, at the War Memorial at 6 o'clock, we're showing a short film called If Only. And as the mayor mentioned, it's uh, produced by Jim Wahlberg, Mark Wahlberg's brother, and also the executive director of his foundation. Uh, the hopes is to promote, to continue, to start wherever uh, the parents and the kids are at, a conversation about the um, prescription abuse and the opioid uh, epidemic that we are currently in. Um, some of the studies show that 80% of parents are talking to their kids about uh, alcohol, about 81% are talking to their kids about marijuana, but only about 14, 15% are talking to their kids about prescription uh, drug misuse and abuse. So we hope to show the film, have a Q&A afterwards, um, and people that are interested can get tickets on Eventbrite. Our website is just broxtonpolice.eventbrite.com, uh, or they can go to our Facebook page and get a link from there. Do, do you want me to take the full three minutes? Because I, well, I could give a quick education on opioids if anybody wants it. Uh, well, why don't I just, I'll just jump in and add on to Officer Liedberg. So there will be a number of events uh, going on simultaneously that evening at the Warmer Memorial Building. Uh, Mr. Wahlberg is going to be there in person and, and participate in a discussion at the end of the film. The film itself is a short film. It's about 35 36 minutes. minutes. 36 minutes. Um, but this is an issue that I think the school committee needs to be aware of and all the, the, the families in the city, particularly families with teenagers, uh, need to be aware of the issue of addiction to prescription painkillers. 80% of heroin addicts began with prescription painkillers. So um, uh, there'll be an exhibit called uh, Hidden in Plain Sight. Hidden in Plain Sight, which is also an educational tool for parents. It's a replica of a teenager's bedroom, and uh, gives parents a chance to be taught about and recognize various types of drug paraphernalia, places where teenagers may hide drugs in their room. Uh, it's it's a really good exhibit, and we'll also be having a mobile prescription drug take back. Uh, that evening. So anyone coming to the memorial that night that has excess prescription drugs, uh, unused portions of prescriptions, uh, there'll be a, a collection box present with uh, both uh, a police officer and a representative booster ambulance as caretakers uh, for the collection box. And it's an opportunity to safely discard uh, any unused prescription medication because we know that quite often when people hang on to prescription medication, uh, it then ends up in the hands of someone else that uh, misuses it. So 
Um, quite often, particularly with kids, they may get their first access to prescription painkillers out of their parents' or grandparents' medicine cabinet. So it's really important that if there's an unused portion of a prescription, to bring it and, and uh, it'll be disposed of par properly uh, by the police department. Uh, so a lot of things, but July 12, uh, July, January, January 12th, 6 p.m. at the uh, War Memorial Building. We hope that you'll uh, help us spread the word. We're looking forward to having a big audience that night. And just as an aside as well, uh, it is marketed for kids older than 13, so we're trying to target middle school kids and their parents. Okay. But we still have about 75 tickets left. Great. All thank right. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Officer Lieber. So important. Um, I had the opportunity uh, to view, I was mentioning to the mayor, the film on uh, the heroin problem on Cape Cod. Uh, I believe this was coming from the governor's opioid task force. Well, no, they, uh, we had a chance to, to preview it, but it was produced by a, a filmmaker for HBO documentary follows the lives of about uh, eight, eight young adults on Cape Cod in their early 20s that are all addicted to heroin. And uh, it's pretty eye-opening if you haven't had any first-hand experience with it. If you get the opportunity, you know, take a look at it on demand. It was yeah, about... It's called uh, Heroin Cape Cod USA. But what's portrayed in that uh, film documentary uh, is representative of what's going on in every single community in the Commonwealth doesn't matter if it's an affluent suburb, if it's a gateway city, doesn't matter. And uh, for, for those of you who weren't uh, hanging on my every word during my speech yesterday, I gave out the statistic that people need to know that in the city of Brockton this past year, we had over 100 deaths due to overdoses. Over 100 deaths. Over a thousand Narcan saves by our first responders. Over a hundred deaths. Um, so, you know, anyone that thinks that our community is not being impacted dramatically by this uh, just isn't aware of what's going on. A hundred deaths this year, over a hundred. The opening of that film does have a pharmacist talking about, again, some of these young kids, you know, sports injuries. Um, you know, many of it was, again, prescription medication that led yeah. to the uh, heroin use yeah. and abuse. Okay, that wasn't on the agenda, but Sorry. thank you very much. No, so we hope uh, anyone that can make it uh, will come out next Tuesday night at 6 o'clock to the War Memorial Building. Okay, let's get moving here. Uh, election of the Secretary. Uh, do, I have, do we take a motion on this term? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Um, at this time, the school committee needs to nominate a secretary of the school committee. Um, it is the individual who's in charge of keeping the minutes um, and making sure that uh, all protocols are followed. Um, and traditionally, that role has uh, fallen to the superintendent of the schools. So I would make a motion at this time to appoint Superintendent Smith as the secretary for the school committee in the year coming forward. Okay, so we need a second. second. Okay, motion has been made properly uh, seconded to elect uh, Superintendent of Schools Kathleen Smith as the secretary of the Brockton School Committee. All in favor? Opposed? Approved unanimously. Uh, my First unanimous yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't get used to it. Yeah. Shouldn't we be thanking you? Yeah. Uh, my next piece of business here is to recognize the outgoing vice chair. So for people that are not familiar uh, with the structure of, of Brockton City Government, the mayor sits as the chair of the school committee. Um, it's extremely important for the school committee to uh, select a vice chair. Uh, the vice chair is going to chair all of the subcommittees of the whole. Uh, and my role as mayor is strictly to chair formal school committee meetings. I am not a member of the subcommittees. So the vice chair serves as the chair of any committees of the whole, finance, policy, safety, um, curriculum, that's the other one, I'm sorry, curriculum, finance, and policy. So uh, 
and also the um, the vice chair and is in essence for the other members of the school committee the chair and the conduit through which most communication with the superintendent would go through the vice chair so uh, first before we get to electing a new one uh, we need to recognize the outgoing chair and uh, Mr. Minicello served uh, as the vice chair this past session and actually according to his plaque uh, he has now served as vice chair for the last six consecutive years uh, so uh, Tom does a great job he was the vice chair during the time that uh, I served on the school committee at least most of it uh, so Tom uh, we'd like to present this to you in recognition of your service to the school committee picture with the superintendent. Thank you very much. Oh, why don't you hold that? There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. I also want to thank Vice Chairman. I also want to thank Vice Chairman Tom Minicello. Um, he has certainly been there from the beginning. Um, I know we recently hosted an evening with our new school committee members uh, talking about the parts they will play. Um, we're privileged to have some veteran school committee members that have worked very, very hard, certainly the past couple of years, and we do appreciate uh, Mr. Minicello as vice chair and certainly, Judy, the time that you have put in with many, many hours of subcommittee and, and a lot of hard work. So we look forward to, to joining our ranks and uh, picking up some of that hard work. So thank you. So, uh, now having recognized the outgoing vice chair, uh, at this point the school committee needs to elect a vice chair for the upcoming year, and I will uh, entertain a nomination. Ms. Sullivan. I'd like to uh, nominate Thomas Minicello. Okay, we have a nomination has been made. Second. Properly seconded. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Um, I sure. I'd just like to say um, that Tom does a great job. He takes it very seriously and he takes care of us. And, he, and thank you for your many years of service doing it. Thank you, Jim. All right. I've had the privilege of you know, being vice chair over uh, the course of, as you mentioned, six years and um, a couple of different school, co actually a few different school committees, uh, three. And um, I'd just like to say that. Uh, the outgoing school committee, um, you know, we're a wonderful group of people. Um, I look forward to working with the incoming group. Um, I think we have some very uh, heartfelt and um, well-intentioned members. Um, as I did speak with you privately when we met to go over some of the different protocols, um, you know, we all have one vote. It doesn't matter that I'm the vice chair. It doesn't matter that I've been here for years. It doesn't matter that Judy um, is a veteran member. We all have an equal vote when it comes to whatever the issue is. And um, my only advice to you is that when you vote and you consider an issue, if you have the best intentions of the kids in mind and you're just doing, trying to do the right thing, you can't go wrong because, you know, whether you disagree or you don't with everybody else, if, you, if, if in the back of your mind you're doing what you think is right for kids in the issue, then you know, no one can say you did the wrong thing. So just remember that, you know, politics. The thing I love about the school committee is that it's, it's really not about politics. It's about a budget. It's about effectively utilizing that budget in the best interest of the district and to promote and um, provide our students with the best education possible. Um, and like I said, if you do that, you'll, you'll be fine. So you know, I look forward to working with every one of you. Um, and you know, if we disagree on certain issues or certain votes, that's fine. I mean, it's going to happen. Um, you know, not everyone's going to agree on everything because it might affect your school or your program in a different way. And that's okay to have disagreement, but it's, it's good to be respectful to one another and, you know, listen to the opinions of the other people, you know, and just, um, you know, act as a unified body. Um, and if there's any issues that you have, um, you know, come to me, come to Judy, come to Tim, um, because, you know, we've, we've done this a little longer than you guys. Uh, 
So uh, again, it's, it's been a privilege and it'll be an honor to continue to serve. And um, like the mayor and I have a little bit of history and I think we work well together in terms of trying to keep things organized and uh, the meetings, well, sometimes they're not timely, but <laughs> we're going to work on that. But uh, you know, keeping things rolling and moving forward to uh, make sure that the best interests of the district uh, is achieved. So. Thank you. I appreciate the confidence. Yeah, the great acceptance speech will take the vote. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little presumptuous. It's going to be ugly if someone else gets nominated now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for years to come. <laughs> Nomination has been made and properly seconded for Mr. Minicello to serve as vice chair of the Brockton School Committee. All in favor? Opposed? Congratulations, Tom. Thanks. We'll assume that your previous remarks will suffice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, at this time now, our next piece of organizational business is the election of two members of the Brockton School Committee to serve as uh, the school committee representatives to the Community <coughs> Schools Advisory Board. Uh, it's, it's a really important role. Um, and it's uh, the one committee assignments that are not uh, appointed by me, but are instead uh, elected by the members of the committee. So we need uh, two members who are willing to uh, serve, and uh, we'll open the floor for nominations. And some willingness to um, get involved with this organization and this, this branch of the school system. Um, I would nominate uh, Lisa Plant and Brett Quarmley to serve as our representatives to the Community School Board. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, two members nominated to serve uh, on the Community Schools Advisory Board, Lisa Plant and Brett Quarmley. Uh, are there any other nominations? So we'll close the nominations and I'll entertain a motion. Motion to appoint um, Ms. Plant and Mr. Gormley to the Community School uh, Board as the representatives for the school committee. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Congratulations, uh, congratulations Lisa and Brett. We look forward to working with the Community Schools Advisory Board. Holds a very special place in the superintendent's heart. It, does, it certainly does. Wonderful job supporting our students, the community. Our director, Maxine Richardson, is up there, I'm sure. She'll be connecting with you, sitting down and going over you know, some of the duties, but probably having been the director, one of the most important uh, people that serve are our school committee members. You know, they're our supporters, they bring ideas back, um, and again, it's a 40 plus year history in the Brockton Public Schools, um, and we hope to continue that. So thank you. Okay. Next piece of organizational business is the school committee uh, needs to approve a set of rules and orders uh, for the school committee for the upcoming term. Uh, in the packages that you received in advance of tonight's meeting, if you go to the tab for section 5, uh, enclosure number 5 is a copy of the rules and orders of the Brockton School Committee. And uh, I will accept a motion in terms of approving and adopting these rules and orders. Motion has been made to approve. Second. Second by Mr. Sullivan. All in favor? Opposed? The rules and orders of the Brockton School Committee are approved for the upcoming session. If you go to your next uh, tab in your book, uh, enclosure number six, uh, working very closely uh, with uh, the superintendent and Mr. Minicello who was serving as the vice chair at the time. Uh, I have uh, put together a set of appointments, uh, assignments I should say, to all of the various subcommittees and for uh, people in the public that are watching the subcommittee work is extremely important. It's really where a lot of the heavy lifting is really done. Uh, the school committee members spend hours each month in subcommittee meetings uh, working on the business of the school department, working closely with the superintendent and her executive team uh, and the principals and, and, and the other representatives of the school district. And a lot of the uh, 
items that are presented at the formal school committee meeting are often the result of numerous uh, subcommittee meetings covering many hours. Uh, so the, the work that goes on at the subcommittee level is really where the real work takes place and uh, these assignments are very important for people that cannot see in our books. There are three, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, about fifteen or sixteen subcommittees. So uh, again in the package that you received in advance tonight uh, were the assignments that I made to subcommittees after consulting with the superintendent and uh, I will, unless anyone has an objection, will accept a motion to accept these subcommittee assignments. Motion to approve the subcommittee assignments as presented. Second. Second by Mr. D'Agostino. All in favor? Opposed? The subcommittee assignments are approved and everyone has a copy of them. We have a very brief consent agenda tonight, uh, but for the new members in particular, the consent agenda is the manner in which at school committee meetings we're able to uh, handle a lot of the routine business as one block to expedite keeping the meeting, meeting moving along. We uh, adopted this model several years ago. It works. Uh, what's important to know and particularly one of the reasons why it's important to review the material that's sent out to you on the Friday before a school committee meeting uh, is that any, mem any individual member of the school committee can ask that any item in the consent agenda be removed for individual consideration and discussion and we do that fairly often. So uh, in reviewing your material, if you have a particular question or a comment regarding uh, one of the items in the consent agenda, it's at this point you would simply, I will ask if any items would like to be removed and you indicate to me which item it is. We take it out of the consent agenda and we'll have individual discussion. But a lot of the things in the consent agenda are very just kind of routine mechanical items and so to keep uh, the meeting moving along and keep people from changing the TV channel at home, we handled some of those routine items as, as one block of business. So if you look at your agendas for this evening, uh, there are only three items on tonight's consent agenda. It's approval of minutes of a previous meeting. Uh, I think that most of you probably would not even want to weigh in on that because you weren't members of the school committee at the previous meeting. Uh, and, and notifications to the school committee of some personnel appointments and personnel actions and keep in mind that those are notifications. They're not for us to be involved in making the decision. The superintendent of schools runs the school, uh, the school system on a day-to-day -day basis, but this is a notification from the administration to the school committee, so the school committee is kept aware of personnel decisions that the superintendent and, and her uh, top managers are making. So uh, having said all of that, uh, we have a consent agenda of three items and I'll, uh, I guess I need to ask, is there any individual item in the consent agenda that a member of the committee would like uh, to be removed for individual consideration? Hearing and seeing none, I'll accept a motion on approval of the consent agenda in its entirety. Motion to approve consent agenda in its entirety. Second. Second, Mr. Sullivan. Motion has been made and properly seconded to uh, approve the consent agenda in its entirety. All in favor? Opposed? The consent agenda is approved. Uh, I am going to jump uh, one item out of order. Uh, each at every school committee meeting will also uh, give school committee members an opportunity to uh, refer an item of business or a potential future item of business uh, to a subcommittee. It's a way in which an individual member of the committee can bring an issue to the the, the table of the school, full school committee to be referred to one of our subcommittees for discussion or consideration. Um, so you probably don't have any tonight, but as we're going along, if you have a particular issue or question or concern of more than a routine nature, more than just a phone call to the superintendent, you feel there's something that you would like the committee as a whole to take a look at, it's at this point of the meeting that you would request that uh, an issue or topic that be directed to a subcommittee. So are there any items tonight that a school committee member would like to direct to a subcommittee? Hearing none, I'll assume that there are none and we'll move on. Uh, at this time uh, we uh, hear from the superintendent of schools for the superintendent's report on teaching and learning. 
Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do want to start the meeting, uh, unfortunately, on, on a sad note. Um, we were notified over the Christmas holidays of the untimely death of one of our staff members, a, a teacher in our bilingual department up here at Brockton High School, uh, Josette Dubois. I had the opportunity to work with Josette uh, when I was in community school. She did a number of programs, expressways to English, summer programs to support students. Um, she certainly, you know, I always talk about being a part of the Brockton Public School family, and that's exactly what it is. Um, when we got word she was visiting relatives in Delaware, uh, her family is from Brockton, her children attended the Brockton Public Schools, uh, so it truly has been a heartbreak for all of us. Um, I do want to thank uh, Principal Sharon Wilder, who immediately upon return from the Christmas holidays made sure over the weekend that she was at the home supporting this family, because that's what happens here. So when I say that to you, that you know people go above and beyond because they care, they genuinely care. Uh, the teachers, uh, as much as information was shared with them before they came back, it's very difficult to come back and know that a colleague that you stood beside, that you shared daily things with, is no longer going to be here. Um, the students, uh, many of these students that she taught, it was their first time in the country. It wasn't just being a teacher. It was a mentor. It was navigating a whole new world. So there's been a lot of heartbreak. Um, I, I'm pleased to tell you that first student actually has come forward. Deputy Superintendent uh, Thomas contacted them. The wake will be Friday evening in Roslindale, and I believe the funeral mass is Saturday, uh, the funeral service. And um, they're going to provide a bus so students that want to attend the services are able to go in a safe manner. So, again, we're very pleased with our partner coming forward and supporting us during this time. So, again, I... Um, my heartfelt sympathy to our staff uh, and certainly to the Dubois family. So I would ask for a moment of silence before I continue. Um, I also see we have a welcome to a new student representative. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right. Is it Bermain? Bastion, Bermain, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? We're very pleased to have you as we begin our new term with our new school committee and our new student representative. Um, well, as you said, my name is Bermain Bastion. Um, I am a senior here at Brockton High School. I have been here for four years. Um, well, I wanted to join the student committee because, well, when I've been here, I haven't really been a part of much. So when I heard the opportunity, um, I decided to take it. So I'm very excited to be part of this community. Do you have some things to share with us, with us this evening um, about the happenings at Brockton High? Yeah, um, um, Brockton High is preparing for the access testing um, for English language learners. Um, the test will begin next Wednesday, January 13th. Uh, students and families will be receiving a Connect Ed call with details about that testing. Um, second, the History Day at Brockton High will be Wednesday, January 20th from 8 to 10.30. The, pro the projects will be on display in the cafeteria, so anybody can stop by if they want to see them. And um, we did lose a dear teacher here over vacation, um, Ms. Dubois. She was a teacher in the bilingual department, um, and she was an advisor of many clubs. I had a chance to participate in such as in like Caribbean Club and Haitian Club. She was very kind, sweet, and she was a very dedicated teacher. Um, as a Haitian, she made me proud <laughs> to be who I am. Um, and her services on Friday and Saturday in Brockton High will miss her very greatly. Very nice. Very good, Bermaine. Thank well, we look forward to having you. Thank you. Um, so uh, a couple of things I want to uh, bring to your attention that we did just get our uh, enrollment report. So for January of 2016, 17,485. Uh, that is up 27 students from last year at this time. Not a surprise. As we continue to look at districts that are losing students, we continue to gain students. Not quite at the speed previously over the past couple of years, but you know our projection is from that October 1st date, which is where the enrollment is counted as far as our funding goes. Many times during the year, by the time the school year has ended, we have uh, over an additional three to 400 students that have registered uh, in the Brockton Public Schools. So I think that trend continues to happen. So, can I make a quick comment? Yes. I think maybe Tom would like to too. So I uh -huh. think particularly for the 
for the new members of the committee, it's really important to understand what the financial impact of that is. The amount of Chapter 70 state local aid to education that we will receive next year is determined by our enrollment on this October 1st. In a gateway city like Brockton, where one of maybe half a dozen cities in the entire state that experiences this phenomenon that we have a steady flow of new students coming into the school system every day. It's not like, you know, people move during the summertime and in September we've got who we're going to get. New students are arriving at our door steady all year. So most of our growth in the in this current school year is going to occur after October 1st. Now the hit of that is if between October 1st and the end of the school year, let's say we took in 250 students, uh, not only are we collecting nothing for our cost of educating them this year, but we're not going to collect anything towards the cost of educating them next year either because they weren't on the roster on October 1st. So in essence, any student that comes into the system after October 1st, we are burdened with the cost of the education of that student for essentially two years, a portion of a year, plus the second remaining full year, with absolutely no reimbursement from the state. So when you're going to hear us talking a lot, I think, in the upcoming months about the inequities in Chapter 70 funding and how in many ways uh, an urban uh, gateway city school district like Brockton is discriminated against in the current manner in which local aid to schools is awarded because there's only a, vast, a handful of school districts that see this significant growth in their student enrollment during the year and there's no provision to reimburse us for this. Now, to put this in dollars, we're using very round numbers. If the reimbursement was 10,000 per student, it's actually a little more than that, but at 10,000 per student, 250 students, that's a loss of $2.5 million to our budget this year. And if the students coming in after October 1st, if we think about two years, that's a $5 million hit. Uh, to our budget. So when we sit down and start looking at this budget this spring and we think about, well, what are, you know, when, when your constituents ask you, what are the reasons why every year do we seem to be struggling with these multi million dollar deficits and having to make really tough decisions? Well, this is one of the really uh, significant contributing factors is that we're getting no reimbursement for the growth in our uh, student population. Uh, during the year and it's really very specific to about half a dozen gateway cities that see this constant growth in their student enrollment during the entire school year. So um, it, it's something that I think we need to be familiar with and we need to be talking about and Tom, the superintendent, and I, some of the other former members, we've certainly had this conversation with our state legislative delegation numerous times, you know, and, and remind them about the inequities in this system because it really is extremely unfair and prejudicial against a school district like Brockton because all of the surrounding communities are essentially level enrollment. Most of them are actually losing a little bit of enrollment each year. There's no impact to them. The real impact is on half a dozen gateway cities that because we're gateway cities we see our enrollment significantly increase after October 1st. So either the date has to be pushed back or there has to be an adjustment for students that come in after October 1st. And until those things happen, we are being penalized by the state to the tune of millions of dollars of lost education aid each year that we then have to find a way to cover and, and be put in a position to make decisions we should never have to make. Mr. Michella. We, um, one year when the mayor uh, was on the school committee, and I think Timmy was on with us, uh, we experienced the Haitian earthquake, and we had close to 300 kids just from that situation come in, in addition to the normal increase over that year. So you're talking about, you know, close to 400 and some odd children coming in, you know, in one period of time. And again, like the mayor said, 
not being reimbursed basically you know for almost two years um, that's huge I mean that's almost a small elementary school when you consider that I, I think the Huntington how many students are at the Huntington roughly yeah, I mean that, that's that's you know three quarters of the Huntington school. I mean, so I mean try to fund a school system with that kind of a um, you know financial hit. Um, so when we do have our retreat, one of the issues that we're going to talk about, and one of the issues that we uh, put on the back burner until the new committee came in is you know what steps is Brockton going to take with respect to rectifying this inequity um, going forward. Um, so that's definitely something we have to do. Um, the other thing is that just historically, um, when uh, the three of us were on the committee uh, years back, we only had about 15,000 kids. So we are seeing a, an increase, steady increase, you know, every single year. I mean, and, and why is that? Well, there's a bunch of reasons we have, you know, in this area. But a lot of people would say is, you know, affordable housing. We also have a very good school system that's recognized throughout the state, and we attract people from, you know, other communities, uh, other urban communities, uh, uh, other countries, um, and we even have kids coming from some of the uh, local towns that um, want to partake in, you know, the programs that we have, um, you know, which basically are second to none. Um, so uh, there, there's a whole host of factors, but um, that is a definite reality um, that puts Brockton and other urban centers behind the eight ball. Um, because like the mayor said, some of the, you know, like an Easton or a Sharon, their numbers are pretty steady. Those, those families usually plan out their move pretty well. They plan out, you know, we'll move in the summer or, you know, we'll the start of the school year. Um, they're not dealing with, you know, homeless situations and financial hardship and um, just a host of all the, the issues that um, we deal with in Brockton on a daily basis. Um, but I think we handle it with dignity and I think we educate um, the students in the school district very well and it's something that this community um, should be very proud of. Um, and you know, that's why I'm still here in Brockton, a proud Brocktonian, so. Uh, that I would like this new school committee to know is, and we've talked about it, is last year there was actually a review of the Chapter 70 funding formula for cities and towns, and Aldo Petronio, our chief budget officer, and myself, Aldo attended just about, I think, every meeting. Um, I had the opportunity to speak at one of those meetings that they held throughout the state. And one of the recommendations that we made was to change the date from October 1st simply to February 1st. Give us a little bit more time, you know, and kind of cut it, cut it in half as far as the months left in the school year. And that was not something we've gotten a preliminary report back. We'll actually be talking about it this Friday at an urban superintendent meeting, but that wasn't one they were willing to bend on, and I'm not sure why. That to me would have been an easy fix for those of us that are dealing with these numbers. But that's just one piece. And as the mayor said, when we talk about our retreat coming up, you know, certainly one of our big focuses will be the budget and will be Chapter 70 and talking about all those nuances. And, uh, you know, one of the quick reference while we're discussing it, it also gives us uh, a financial hit. Uh, Tom, you mentioned homeless, and so the reality is that Brockton as a community has the third largest uh, population of homeless families in the state. And that's because the state has chosen to use three hotels in the city as emergency shelters for homeless families. Beyond that, there are, I believe, I think, 89 or so scattered individual locations in the city also uh, that are being used by the state uh, to shelter homeless families. So not to be misunderstood, we welcome the children of these families into our system, we embrace them, and we provide them with a lot of extra services because usually they've been through some trauma, they've probably had some interruption in the continuity of their education, there are some big challenges there. But, again, using round numbers, there's approximately 600 students in our system that are uh, classified as, as homeless. Out of those 600, only about 200 of them are actually from Brockton. About two-thirds of the students in our system that are identified as homeless uh, are not from Brockton. They came to Brockton by being 
relocated here as, as a result of the homelessness. So, you know, just once again, you know, this is a really a regional, statewide, national issue of homelessness. But in this region, we are bearing an unfair share of the burden. Uh, there are not 600 homeless kids in the Easton Public Schools or in the Abington Public Schools, but there are in the Brockton Public Schools, and it creates a financial burden. So again, we, we love those kids, we welcome them, we embrace them, we do everything we can to support them, but it costs a lot of money, and that, that burden is not being shared fairly amongst all the other communities. So it's another inequity in the system and you say, well, how do you get so many kids coming in during the course of the year? That's one of the reasons because, you know, families that have been struck with homelessness being placed into emergency housing in the city of Brockton and those kids come in. There's a second hit afterwards because of the McKinney-Vento law Eventually, if those families are fortunate enough to be relocated someplace to permanent housing outside of Brockton, typically, under McKinney-Vento, those children are allowed to remain in the Brockton public school system and we, as a school system, are required to provide them with transportation from wherever they're relocated to. So I'm telling you, we have a lot of students commuting every day from Fall River, New Bedford, Taunton, uh, and a lot of other communities. And that transportation is expensive. And again, using round numbers from last year's budget, we spent about a million dollars on transportation for students who were classified homeless and relocated outside the city. We spent a million dollars in just transportation for those students and our reimbursement from the state was only about half of that amount, about half a million. Are those numbers close, Aldo? Exactly, 960,000 were reimbursed half a year later. Though. Right, reimbursed half a year later after we've incurred the expenses. So just on transportation for students that were placed in emergency housing in Brockton and then relocated elsewhere, you know, we're taking a, a hit of a million dollars a year, we get about half of it back eventually. And so again, you, I think it's important, and it's going to be important for you to be able to discuss some of these issues with your constituents, you know, as we are going to struggle with another deficit again this year. Lisa, go ahead. Is that transportation just for the rest of the school year? No, for as long as they continue to remain in the Brockton Public Schools. Thank you. They have the right to stay under McKinney Vento. And it's extremely expensive. So again, we welcome the children, but there should be some additional reimbursement from the state for what in essence is 50% of that is an unfunded mandate. We don't have any discretion. We're getting stuck with the bill, and most communities in the state are not being stuck with these types of bills. There's got to be some reimbursement for it. So I, I don't mean to sermonize, but I think with five new members here right now, four plus Tim, uh, I, I think it's these are some you're really going to have to get caught up on a lot of stuff really fast because as we get into this budget cycle, which is starting right now, um, you're going to need to be prepared to, to be able to articulate to your constituents why we're in the shape we're in. Tom? see this firsthand. Um, Mr. Sullivan is the chair of that. Um, Lisa Plant and Joyce Azak are on that. So every um, month you will be meeting and going over bills that come in to the district that are paid. And um, you basically will see some of those transportation bills and you'll sort of scratch your head and say, what's this? Or, you know, what, what, what's, what's this $100,000 a year bill? Some of our special ed bills are huge because we have children that go out of the district that need this type of care. And you know, and when I first got on that subcommittee when I was on when I was a, a, a newbie, I was like, wow, it was eye opening. You know, the the types of services that we pay for, and of course, you know, it comes out of our overall budget. And you know, the more special ed, the more transportation. Um, you, you, it basically takes from the entire pot and so it's going to be an interesting year. I'm glad you guys signed up. <laughs>
but it's going to factor into decisions, I think, which we're going to be, and I, the people we're representing, will be really unhappy with. You know, as we look towards this year's budget and future budgets, I think we're going to have to really have a, uh, an open and frank discussion as to what our policy is around providing transportation for students. Uh, transportation for our own kids, for all of the kids, is very expensive. Well, we could be forced into a position that we can't afford to provide transportation to, to students who live here in the city because we're spending, because we're losing half a million dollars a year providing transportation to students who don't live in the city, but we are required to by law. So the, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but I, I think the impact of Brockton being having the third highest homeless population in the state and, and also the fact of how our enrollment comes in and being a gateway city there are some uh, real inequities in the way that uh, the formula is calculated for chapter, chapter 70 local aid to schools which is our primary source of funding. Sorry, Superintendent. Yes, I, I wish there was an easy fix. Uh, we will be having these discussions going forward. As usual, Brockton seems to be at the forefront of all of these discussions. You have heard us talk about equity in education lawsuits. Um, we continue um, to look at McKinney-Vento. We continue to look at all these stressors on our budget. And I want you to know that we certainly are trying to have a voice. And it isn't about educating kids. We do it better than anybody. And when you talk about some of these children coming in, as the mayor said, I've been in the district almost 40 years. We did not have three and four hotels, you know, for, which is not where children belong. That's the first thing that I know the governor is attempting to, to take a look at. These children belong in a home. So, you know, they are, as, as much as we support them, and I agree, nobody does it better. They're welcomed. Our teachers do a fabulous job. Um, it does put stress on the school district and, and on our budget, and we'll continue to have these discussions uh, as to how to support our students and our families. Okay, okay uh, so let me bring up now the rebuttal of the New Heights Charter School. Okay. Um, so this is due tomorrow. Um, the mayor has signed, uh, Mr. Minicello has signed as vice chair. There will be a copy for each of you. We will be delivering our rebuttal. Very different than last year when we took a look at the prospectus, took a look at it from every one of our departments as to how deficient the application was and it was rejected. Of course, you know, again, when we did that, we gave them all of the information that they needed to continue forward. But to me and to all of us, and I want to thank the executive team, and I particularly want to thank uh, Dr. Sal Tarasi, uh, Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry, uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel, and Michelle Bolton for sitting down uh, with myself um, and putting together a rebuttal that talks. Uh, again, I just want to touch on a few points. One of the things we talked about was under Ed Reform in 1993, there was a piece carved out for charters. It was supposed to be 25 charters. They were supposed to be able to share best practices and fill unmet community needs with innovative initiatives and solutions. That is far from what is happening with charters, and the numbers have risen to, I think, over 70 plus in the state. So we're certainly well beyond what the original compromise was under the Ed Reform Act. There's very few, if any, sharing of best practices and when research has shown what some of the best practices are, extended learning time, the legislature isn't willing to support uh, those kinds of so-called best practices. So the other thing that I want you to hear that we have talked about, and this came across from every uh, local official, one of the things that they were saying is there is no demand for this charter. They went out and knocked on countless doors during your political season or their constituents continually calling with the things that they do want to see in a public school system. That has not been the outcry. So simply because we have seat capacity, and I know Mr. Gormley, you and I have had conversation you know, coming from Boston as far as what charters do and do not do. We do not feel this will serve our community in any way. What they has, have proposed, we have certainly done in the Brockton Public Schools. We have an excellent high school that graduates over 900 students. We have alternative pathways. What they've proposed, we have. So that really is the essence of our rebuttal. I will make sure you get a copy before you leave this evening, and we will be submitting that tomorrow um, as uh, requested on uh, the date of uh, January 6th. Um, quick thank you, please. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to repeat everything the superintendent said, but I believe very strongly. I am 
not as opposed to charter schools as probably most people in the, in, in the school system are. I could see myself supporting the right charter school at the right time if it was going to be done right and it was going to meet a need, needs of students that we're not meeting. But this is the wrong school at the wrong time being operated by the wrong people. It does not make sense for Brockton. It can potentially cost us millions of dollars out of our uh, state local aid to education, Chapter 70. Um, you know, two of our biggest challenges and, and two of our most uh, expensive types of students to educate are English language learners and uh, children with uh, learning disabilities. And if you look through there, this charter school has no real sincere intention to address the needs of either of those two populations. Uh, and we do. We, and as the superintendent said, we do a darn good job at it. But it's expensive and we cannot afford to have a charter school skim off the students that they think will be most profitable for them and leave behind the most expensive students to educate while taking millions of dollars out of our budget. It's just not right. And this particular charter school was designed to be a college prep high school. That's the last thing we need. We've got the best urban high school. We've got one of the best high schools, period, anywhere. And I know it's cited in, in the rebuttal, um, but you know, this year's graduating class at Brockton High, 92% went on to post-secondary education. Tell me any other urban district gateway city that puts 92% of their graduates into college. And if you include the children, the, I should say children, the young adults going into the military, the number's closer to 94%. So this is bringing a school that's attempting to meet a need we don't have. We're doing a great job in, in our, you know, 6 through 12 college prep. We're doing a great job at that. So I mean, if they want to ram a charter school down our throat, let's at least bring us one that might address a need that we have. I mean, if they bring us a technical institute, I'd be willing to talk about that. Uh, you know, you know uh, technical training or something. We have 600 students that apply to Southeastern Regional Vote Tech each year and only 300 get in. That means there's 1,200 kids in the school that wanted to go to Southeastern and didn't get in. So I mean, if it's a technical institute of some time, I'd be willing to have that conversation. But um, wrong school, uh, wrong, wrong school, wrong people operating at wrong place, wrong time. It really doesn't make sense for Brockton. So I have had an opportunity to, to personally lobby both the governor and lieutenant governor to let them know how strongly I feel that this does not meet a need here in the city of Brockton and doesn't make sense. But honestly, I just don't know. It's a great rebuttal, but the fact is that, you know, this school was turned away last year. They're back again. They did an end run on Brockton even being a location. We're not in the bottom 10%. They went and enlisted uh, Taunton and Randolph so they could use their weaker statistics uh, to lump Brockton in with those two communities to, to put a charter school for all three, but clearly their intent is to attract Brockton students. They're looking to locate the school in Brockton. The number of kids that are going to be commuting from Randolph or Taunton to attend a Brockton charter school is not going to be a very large percentage of their population. It was an end run on Desi's requirements. So. Uh, I do appreciate the great job, Superintendent, that your team did in preparing this rebuttal, and uh, hopefully it won't fall upon deaf ears. And I just want to bring to your attention as you read it this evening, um, one of the statistics that just recently came out is all on uh, student discipline, and they look at the number of suspensions. Um, and, and while it's a fact of education, you know, there are times when students need to be disciplined, the schools that were the top 19 out of 20 with excessive student disciplines were all charter schools. And you know exactly what happens to those students that are disciplined. They end up back on our doorstep. When we told you about that October 1st date, they're not back on October 1st. They're back on October 2nd and down, you know, onward. And at that point, again, they're part of their student uh, enrollment, which they report on October 1st. Saw that this September school, uh, we had an influx of charter students uh, at the first three or four weeks of school, and um, 
the students were discipline problems at their school. Uh, I think maybe two of them have been a discipline problem for us. So I think that parents would be pretty disappointed to see that um, their student would be um, asked to leave or even kicked out of the school that they thought was going to be um, a great program for them. Um, and that's just not what I've seen in, in my experience with the Boston Public Schools. And speaking to uh, special uh, needs students and students with learning disabilities, a lot of the students that we've received um, were not receiving the services that they were supposed to get as the state requires and they're not being held accountable for that. Um, and we're left in the public school system to clean up a mess that's been created by a lot of people that aren't qualified to handle these type of students and when they come back to us they have IEPs that are written really poorly and we don't know exactly what's going on with a student for maybe a month or two and that's a huge um, that's a huge detriment to a child's education to lose that much time um, on learning. So, and you yeah. don't get that back. There's no second bite at the apple. Yeah. And that is mentioned in the rebuttal. You'll you'll be able to read that. Okay, uh, I also want to go on to uh, tell you that we did receive our draft report of comments from our coordinated program review, our CPR review, which was held this past fall with SPED, our uh, Civil Rights and Career Vocational Technical Education. We have 10 business days to, uh, for uh, a report period to comment on any factual uh, accuracies or inaccuracies of the department's findings, and we have to report that by January 14th. I know our team is, is already reviewing all of these findings and we'll be sending their comments in in a timely manner. And also we're going to be talking about, uh, and it will not be this evening, but I want to bring to your attention, certainly we've all grown up in education in the past, how many years? No Child Left Behind came in early 90s? I'm trying to remember when it came in. So, so No Child Left Behind, so we now have Every Student Succeeds Act, so ESSA, you'll be hearing quite a bit about it. Uh, the President signed it, I believe, in December, an, an executive order. And uh, some of the highlights, um, and Congress passed with strong bipartisan support on this new Every Student Succeeds Act. They're ensuring states have high standards set, maintaining accountability, empowers state and local decision makers, and you saw that happen with our new MCAS 2.0 that will be coming in, preserve annual assessments and reduce the often uh, onerous burden of unnecessary and ineffective testing. That will be interesting to see how that unfolds, and provides more children with access to high quality preschool. I'm also looking forward to see if the funding comes along with this act to, su to support that, certainly in a community like Boston, and establishing a new resources to drive better outcomes. So we will be sharing a lot of that information with you as we really unpack uh, this new uh, act that replaces No Child Left Behind. And a couple of things before I ask Dr. Cancel to come up and do his presentation. I wanted you to know that our, I'm sorry, um, did you have your hand up Mr. D'Agostino? Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Um, our final site website is being upgraded. Uh, it's a totally new platform. I think uh, our parents and our community will be very pleased with the design that we're viewing. Uh, our communications director, Michelle Bolton, along with Kathy Ettinger, who's been serving uh, as our, our web manager, uh, has they've been working on this. Uh, we're bringing in some additional help. It's, it's quite a bit of work to become familiar with this, but we hope to unveil this in late spring to the community. And uh, I also want you to know that I'm going to be meeting with school leadership to uh, individually review uh, school improvement plans, looking at principal goals, and we will be talking to you as we go along, and especially as we look at uh, a very strained budget, looking at some of those things. And when you hear Dr. Cancel speak tonight, you'll look at some of the challenges we face with our high stakes testing and where we want our students to be, and those will be discussions we'll be having with individual schools. And I want to say that there will be individual decisions made to support these schools. Uh, and to finish up, I, I'm excited about a retreat. I think we'll be talking about a date. Um, we're looking to possibly do it on a Saturday 
January 23rd. I'd like to build the agenda with you, and this will be a first of a number of opportunities. As the mayor stated, all of us have a lot of work ahead of us, and some of it is learning, again, some of the pieces of this puzzle. So I would like to suggest that we spend quite a bit of time at that retreat on budgeting for FY17, looking at uh, net and non-net school spending. I'd like to talk a little bit about our policy manual review for the upcoming year. We've got some uh, excellent resources that we want to share with you from uh, Mass Association of School Committees. So it's something that I would like to move forward with. It almost guarantees that they continue to support us and look at our policy manual once, you, once it is built and reviewed every single year. So our policies continue to remain uh, updated. Any new policies, they share model language with us. So I think it's about time we do an overhaul and really take a look. And that was what the last school committee left for you with all of the work that they were able to do the past couple of years. So I hope that that will be a focus of the retreat. Also, we're going to be looking at the superintendent evaluation and goals that need to be set for the next six months as you uh, evaluate the superintendent. I thought we'd talk a little bit about, have deputy superintendent talk about our facilities. And I'm very pleased to, I don't know if you want to mention the facility master plan has just, I believe, gone out to bid. Yep. I received I something on that this week. Yeah. And also, uh, I'm sure we can talk a little bit about uh, school committee protocols with work in the schools. As I said to you on the 21st, it's the most important work you do, and I'm very pleased to have you involved in our schools and supporting our uh, students, families, teachers, and staff. And that is my report. Are we all set? I'll have Dr. Cancel set up for an uh, update on PARC. Barry joining you? Yes. Okay. And the floor is yours. Good evening. We are uh, thrilled to be here tonight. If uh, it's tough to be between the audience and their lunch, just imagine it at 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> so, um, to put a nice cheery spin on the evening because it's been a little somber, we have that beautiful uh, wintery scene, and an endless supply of bad jokes by me. So here we go. MCAS, park results, 2012-2015. It's MCAS and park. It's a very weird system. This has never happened before. Certainly not by a state where you have a bifurcated system. You have both MCAS, which is required for high school, and you have park, which you had a choice. Half the state took park, half the sta state stayed with MCAS. Everyone took MCAS at the high school. Um, when you have two different tests with different standards, their tests are constructed differently and they're administered differently. Online, paper and pencil. You have a uh, what the state is calling transitional results. So the state has worked very hard to come up with a way to make the two very different tests comparable. As a result of that, everyone is held harmless on accountability. Now this is something that I'm going to talk about later, but I do want to point something out here. Held on this means you can only improve an accountability status. I'm going to say right now that Brockton, yes they did improve, but Brockton did not go down. Hold harmless or no hold harmless, I want to be clear about that. Brockton had a very good year. So while you may have heard tough things about the budget and other things, this is an upbeat presentation. By golly. <laughs> My jokes. Yeah, you get them. Alright, so there's a lot of jargon and I wanted to go over some points with a uh, stunningly colorful um, slide here. CPI, Composite Performance Index, this is what the state has used for achievement. And if you look, you see that it says the MCAS scaled score, and I understand that grades 3 through 8 took part, but I'll, I'll explain that as well. Traditionally on MCAS, if you were down scoring in the red at the bottom, the 200 to 208, 
that's the low warning failing level, you got zero points. If you were in the pink, the 210 to 218, you got 25 points. And it goes up in those increments until you reach 240 or above where you were proficient or advanced and you got 100 points. So this is what the state developed. This has been here from the very beginning. And this is the way you see how well a uh, school is doing on MCAS. With PARC, you have scaled scores, but they're on a different scale. And so what the state has to do is they have to figure a way to take the PARC scaled scores and convert them to MCAS and then convert them to these CPI points. If it sounds complicated, it is. It's not an exact science, which is why they had the held harmless provision. But when you see CPI, you'll see it for English, you'll see it for math, you'll see it for science. That's what CPI means. I wanted to point this out. I thought this was a uh, nice little graphic. I had top secret before in an earlier presentation, but the state has been kind of cagey. They're, they're trying to get their data together. It's very clear, though, from the data that I was able to cobble together that there's a marked difference between if you took PARC online or if you took it paper and pencil. And five of our schools took it online. So these, um, I'm calling these estimated because they're not official, official approved by the state, but these are state numbers that I cobbled together. And this is the difference of the percentage of students scoring level four and five. Now they no longer call level four and five proficient or advanced on PARC, but it is meeting or exceeding the standards of PARC. So you want to score level four or five. And the orange will always be the, the ELA, the blue will always be the math, that, that's our color coding. And it shows that the third graders on the far left, if you took the online test, seven, uh, the difference between the kids who scored level five was seven percentage points. So that's, that's a pretty large difference. You're, at a, you're less likely to score as well if you took the online. It's not as big in fourth grade for ELA. It's very large in fifth grade at eight points. And you can see it, it kind of bounces around, but those are all fairly large numbers. Um, eighth grade, large again. Now, interestingly, on the math side, while third grade is once again large, fourth grade is actually positive. You did better if you took it online. These are state numbers. These are not Brockton numbers. So those are all the districts, and roughly half the districts in the state did this. There are districts that have had one-to-one -one computers for a long time. There are other districts that they're brand new to um, online testing. So the point here is there's a substantial difference based on how you, how you were uh, given the test. And that is an important point to remember when we're looking at how the district did, which is here we are. This is, again, orange is always going to be ELA, and this is the Composite Performance Index, CPI, so ECPI is the ELA portion of it, and it shows how we did as an overall district for the past four years. And we're happy to say that despite new standards, a new test, and they're challenging new standards, that's one of the, this is a college and career readiness, so they, they actually ramped up the standards. So, um, and with five of our schools taking the test online, which we just showed you, there was a marked difference if you took it online, I'd say that this is a nice increase going in the right direction. So despite all the uh, challenges of students coming in and not getting the reimbursements under the McKinney Vento, that's how Brockton did overall as a district, so that's a good story. And now we see math. Math, again, uh, over the past couple of years, moving in the right direction, nice bump up, and once again, this is, a, this is the, uh, the new test. Five schools doing that online. So there you have scores going in the right direction. Science is straight MCAS. Only grades five and grade eight, and then high school, 
take science. So it's not every grade. And it still is MCAS. So that, in that sense, it hasn't changed. And you can see that there's been a, uh, a modest amount of improvement over four years. And over the past year, there's been a, uh, a very slight dip. We break down the scores. So first you get an overall, how did the district do? But the district is really comprised of the elementary, the middle, and the high. And so uh, one, one grade actually in high school takes the, the test. It's grade 10. But so we, we like to look at the different areas and see how they did. And in ELA, you can see that uh, there was no change in the score from the past year. But despite it being this new test, and I really have to point out, a new test, it, it, it is hard. It, it's not just the difficulty of the test itself, which is new standards, and it really, it, it's not always, uh, when you put out a test, it may not be the most age appropriate at all the things. The test will get tweaked over time. That's another reason why to hold it harmless. But it's also, there were a lot of new ways to take this test. It was a time test. We're not used to that. Our kids are used to being told, you have all the time you need. Work, work, work. And our students do that. On Park, it's a time test. That's the way it is. So you take a look at that. You take a look at all the challenges the districts had. And I think that, that that's a uh, pretty decent result. Now, math is actually even better. And this is something that is worth uh, taking note. This is a marked increase. You can, whatever you want to say about the harder test, this is a big deal and it shows some real improvement that has gone on in the math uh, at the elementary level. So I think that's a uh, particularly good news story. And then you see the science, and the science has gone up. It, it is not setting the world on fire, but it is a steady climb up. So we expect to see more of that as we uh, infuse more of the science in. Here's another success story. You see the scores start to be higher, and uh, these middle grades, ELA, the, these are very nice scores, especially the past uh, year, a 3.3 uh, point gain. That's always good. That's statistically significant. That's, that's a good, good showing at the middle grades. Similar story with math over the past year. Uh, four years, it, it's, it's not, but it's good to see that it's headed in the right direction. Science down a little bit. Remember, it's one grade only. Only eighth grade takes the science. Uh, you see that it's, it's virtually unchanged in the four years. This is something that, you know, whenever a charter school, not a charter school, but a charter school wants to talk about a high school coming to Brockton, you might ask, are you kidding? This is an urban district and a 94.1, that's out of 100. You can't get higher than 100. That's not Brockton High either. Brockton High is higher than that. That's all of our students, all of them. There isn't a large urban high school that does this. So it's not a specialty Boston one like I used to you know, be part of. Large urbans, th this is not where you need a high school. So um, very impressive. Math has gone down. It does not mirror the, the uh, state trend. It's something that, you know, I think if you're going to start to see a change, you're going to start to see it at the high school level. The math is, the, the test is changing. Even though it's MCAS, it's becoming more park-like because the entire state is going to go to park eventually, even at the high school level. And uh, you got to make sure that you have the sequence right. And so this is something that I'm sure all the high school people are paying attention to. Science pretty much unchanged, down slightly, up slightly over four years. Those are the achievement results. Now we have that dramatic uh, transition to the student growth percentile. This is tricky, so I'm going to do my best to explain it. 
it, it uh, it's tough to get your head around it, but the big thing to remember, this is growth. It doesn't matter where you start. It's just, you know, like if, if you start high and I start low, it matters how we improve. So that's what growth tries to do. They use the term academic peer group. I'll explain that. <clears throat> but essentially, each student is going to be compared to students with a similar score history. So that's, that's important. They deal in percentiles. The main story here is if you're between 40 and 60, so if you see a number between 40 and 60, that's good. Bottom line. And just so you, you know, feel comfortable with interpretation, if you're in the 70th percentile, it means you're better than 70%. 39th percentile, better than 39%. So this is a, uh, it, I took this from the state. It tries to illustrate what I was just talking about with the academic peer groups. You have three students there. Oh, thanks. Student one, student two, student three. I used to be more original, but now I'm serious. <coughs> that was my humor. Not very funny, I guess. Uh, the student one starts in grade three back in 2013, and they scored a 230, and then they scored a 236. Student two went 268, 268. Student three, 214, 214. I bring that up because these groups those are going to be your academic peer groups. And so what happens is you're put in this academic peer group. So student one is with all the students in the state who scored 230 in grade three, and then 236 in grade four, and then they take the test in grade five. And that 232 gets rank ordered with all the other kids in their peer group. And lo and behold, it turns out that that puts you in the 40th percentile. So that's how they figure out student growth. Now student two was the highest scoring student, but they were in that peer group that was 268, 268. Now most kids who scored 268 and 268 in grades three and four don't score 260. They score higher than 260. So the 260, even though it's the highest score on the page there, compared to that kid's academic peer group, it only puts them in the 25th percentile. And the student number three with the lowest score, well, it turns out the kids who score there rarely go up to 226, so it turns out highest growth. So it doesn't matter so much if you have the highest or lowest score. It matters how you compare to everyone else in your group. And so that's the story with growth. Bottom line is, Anytime you're at 50 or above, you're doing really well. We said 40 to 60, that's, that's good. Anytime you're above 50, that's in good shape. You see this is the ELA, the student growth percentile. The median student growth percentile was a 56 last year, two points higher than the year before, and four uh, from four years. So this is very solid student growth for the district in ELA. Math. Anytime you're above 50 is good. Anytime you're between 40 and 60, nice and solid. 51 right there, that you're down a point, that you're up a point. The thing to remember is it's solid. It's, it's 50. It's 51, actually. Now, you might say, well, what happened to grade 3, Ethan? How come it's grade 4 and 5 only? Grade 3 is the first year you take the test, so you couldn't have improved because you just, that's your baseline. So this is just grade four and grade five at the elementary level. It was a dip down, but the 40 through 60 is the important thing to consider. Um, it is down a little bit. It's not as high as we'd like to see. It's something that you know, we need to work on at that level, grades four and grade five, on a new test <laughs> with that online component that particularly, um, you know, is challenging on the ELA side. Math, you see nice solid 52. The, the numbers do bounce around. You know, 46, 55, 46, 52, it is bouncing around. It happened to be a bounce up. We'll take it. The math scores at the elementary were good on achievement, and they're also good on growth. So that, that's a good sign. 
anytime you see anything above 60, that's really, really good. It's unusual and it's really, really good, especially for you know a district. Maybe a school could jump around, but for a district to be above 60 is very good. That's ELA 6 through 8 student growth. And you see the, the change, 11.7, these are marked. Um, you know, marked improvement. So that's that's nice to see. <clears throat> While this chart is not quite as sanguine, it's not bad because it's still in the 50s, and that's what you want to see. It's down a little bit from last year. It's virtually unchanged from four years. I still will say, anytime you're 50 or above, you're doing pretty well. So. Uh, Grade 10, the growth, again, it's 60. It's not quite as high as it was in the past, but you can't complain about 60, especially for a large district. That probably puts you in like the 80th percentile of all schools. So you, you might say, well, 60 doesn't sound so good. Well, that's the median. That's the middle score. There are lots of kids who score higher. There's some who score lower. 60 is really strong. Um, it is down, but it's not something to be um, worried about. The math, as the achievement was not quite as high as on the ELA side, the math isn't, the growth isn't as high either, but 53 is still solid growth. So it's not something to, you know, um, panic over, but it is something to pay some attention to. And as you see, it is not unusual for student growth to jump. So it, it, it does bounce around. That's why you want to look over a bunch of years and you want to see what range is it in. And this is, you know, mid-50s, there was 160, and uh, any time you're in the 50s, that's good. Another dramatic transition, and what do we see next? Yeah, these are the accountability terms. This is relatively speaking new. The uh, progress and performance index, we just call it PPI. It is incredibly complicated. It violates every rule of accountability being transparent and easy to understand. It is a tough, complicated um, index. It consists of proficiency gap narrowing, which is a, in and of itself not only a mouthful, but it's a complicated measure. Basically, the state said we want everyone to be at 100 for their CPI, which would be proficient or advanced. And we expect that where you are at a certain point in time, 2011, you're going to cut where you are. Let's say you were at 50 and the goal is to be at 100, we want to cut that 50 points in half. You have six years to get 25 points. Every year you have the same number of points that you have to gain. So that's proficiency gap narrowing. Student growth percentile, we just covered that. That's actually pretty easy. And then there are a slew of bonus points. You get bonus points for reducing the number of kids in the warning failure category. You get um, bonus points for increasing the number of students in the advanced category. So there are a bunch of bonus points as well. It's a very complicated index. The other thing about it, there's annual PPI, which you get one year to the next, and then there's cumulative, which is the only thing that you get measured on for accountability. You need to have four years of status to do this. And just so you, you see this, because it's, it's a little bit strange, you don't get any points if you've declined from your targets. You get 25 points for no change. Because every year you're expected to go up, which may or may not be realistic. So they give you some points if you don't change, as long as you don't go down. You, you get 50 points if you improve, but you're below target. Depending on how many points you had to make up, you could have a huge number of points, which is honestly not very realistic. So they want to give you points if you improved, even if you didn't make the target. And then if you make this really challenging target, you get 75 points, which usually when you do well in a test, you get 100 points. Here, if you do well, you get 75 points. So you sort of have to calibrate what good is. Really doing nicely is 75 points. And then if you're above target, you get 100 points. So how did we do? Well, I'm going to give you a little history. Back in 2013, we had no level one schools. That's the best. 
and of course on park, level one is the worst just to confuse people. But level one is what you want. We had no level one schools. We had six level two schools, which is really good. We had 12 level three schools. And what you don't see here is level four, level five. We are the only urban district, large urban district, that has never had a level four school. And I can't tell you what a big deal that is. If it was easy, there'd be one or two other urban, large urban districts. We've never had one, and that is a big accomplishment. In 2014, again, we had no level one, but we moved up one school to level two status, and uh, we, you know, we moved out of level three. And now this year, it was a big breakthrough for us because we had two schools achieve level one status, we have six in the uh, level two, and then we have 10 in level three. And just so you know the difference between level uh, three and level two, there's a state, the, legislat the legislature got involved, and it, it's strange that they did, but they demanded that the bottom 20% of schools would by definition be put in level three. They didn't care what your student body looked like, didn't matter if you had English language learners, special needs, kids in poverty, didn't matter, everyone's lumped together. And it's basically counting things like your achievement. And then you also get these weird bonuses which sort of are redundant. If you have large numbers of kids in advance, you get bonus, and if you have small numbers of kids in one failure, you get bonus. So. Obviously, the Wellesleys, who are achieving really high, get the bonuses also. But that's, it, it was, you know, it is what it is, and this is a big deal to have two level one schools. And those two schools are East, on the matter of Tom Minicello, Mike Thomas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Kennedy School. And that's a real big deal. First time they've, they've done it. Level two, we have plenty of uh, middle schools there. As you can see, the Angelo and Pliff, uh, Davis, you know, just a really nice showing north, Ashfield, West, nice, you know, a lot of middle schools there. And then level three, and again, no level four, which is a big deal. Brockton High School, I put that asterisk there. Um, it's it's actually uh, it's very frustrating. It's much more frustrating to Sharon and Bob over there and the, and the faculty. There's a wrinkle in the accountability system. The wrinkle goes like this: Back in the day with No Child Left Behind, one of the things that drove schools crazy you could be you could be double and triple counted against a school based on how many subgroups you were part of. So if you were a low-income student who was an English language learner who was a uh, student with disability, you would be in those three subgroups and each single subgroup, if a single subgroup missed it in the entire school, the entire school missed it. And schools raved about that and that was unfair and the feds finally said, yep, you're right. So now in Massachusetts you have a high needs group which is if you're an English language learner, if you're a student with disability, if you're a low income student, and then the aggregate. So you're either in high needs or aggregate, and both high needs and aggregate have to make it. You're not double, triple, quadruple counted. Brockton High makes it in every single high needs and aggregate category. So they should be a level one school, except there's one exception to the rule. For your graduation rate, it has to be at a certain level for every single subgroup. And the students with disabilities subgroup at Brockton High does not make that uh, level. Therefore, even though Brockton meets or exceeds all of the other standards, they are by definition not a level two, but a level three school. So we put the asterisk there. It is no doubt the highest achieving large urban school. You know, public school that isn't an exam school. But that's the system and that's just the way the cookie crumbles. 
this shows you the cumulative, so that's a four-year PPI, which the way the state describes it is how you do according to your own targets or against your own targets, and the percentiles, which is how you rank according to everyone else in the state regardless of who you educate. So the, the top number is how you do compared to your own targets, and the yellow box is the percentile, and you can see you obviously want to have the highest of both numbers. Um, East and Brockton High and Kennedy had, you know, just really strong, and they've had strong years for a number of years. These are four years. It's a weighted average, and you can see the percentiles. <coughs> so there you have it. And I put the annual PPI. I wanted to show you the annual uh, percentiles, but I can't put that data together on my own. I don't have all the state data, and I'm waiting for the state to put it out, and the state hasn't finalized it. So I, I can't give you all of the percentiles yet. There are a lot of different things, and part of the schools did PARC, part of the schools did MCAS. I can't put it together yet, but eventually I will, so I'll be able to show that to you. But remember we said that 50 was improving but below target, and 75 was meeting the target, and 100 was exceeding the target. So yes, it, we went down, but it still means that we're improving. It's just improving below target. So that is that. I uh, particularly like that. You like that, Liz? Yeah, I like that. Thank you. So questions? I do. I like it. One of the things that I do want to share with you uh, in looking at these results, which we continue to look at, and you heard me talk about going around to the schools and looking at some of the successes they had, what are the challenges. Um, th there are many factors, but I do want to bring to your attention that when you look at some of our middle schools, you saw East, you know, really improving. Um, you know, they had a redesign grant a number of years ago. There were additional funds put into the school. Um, we saw the Huntington School with additional funds put into the school, showing improvement with a, uh, a very needy population. Um, the Raymond School, we presently have an extended learning time grant. We're focusing again on some of the needs of that school, which actually uh, had a change last year in the configuration of the school. And when you look at the middle schools, what I want to bring to your attention is you the school committee in the past supported a change in the redesign of our middle schools. We went to 6th, 7th, and 8th grades uh, for our middle schools. You put associate principals in those schools to focus on the curriculum and the instruction for all students. We also had common planning time built into their schedule where teachers are meeting every day talking about what has worked in classes, sharing best practices, having professional development on a regular basis. We ha we're starting to build in some of that. It's very costly. When we look at our elementary schools, we've added some additional in-service time. Uh, we weren't able to get common planning time across the board as we have in the middle school. We're starting to look at our Brockton High schedule uh, to also look at some of these things that we think have brought success when you look at level one and level two schools. And when you look at the percentages in urban districts, you know, I, I guess we, we should be concerned, but when you look at the students that come to us, and I can't say it enough, you know, some of the students come to us having never been uh, in any school before they come to us 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, um, you know, English language learners. We look at students in poverty. We talk about the large numbers of homeless students. The one thing that we do see is if the students stay with us, you see, again, the, uh, their scores improve. When you talk about the success at Brockton High School, the numbers that we graduate, the students going on to college and career, we can always improve. But I do feel like we know what works. It's just that we continually need to fight for those funds to really support some of the successes that we've seen. But I assure you, and I'll be sharing with you going out to the schools, myself, uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry, our Executive Directors, uh, Dr. Murray, uh, June Sabre McGuire, and Ethan and myself will have protocols as we go out and talk to the schools again about, as we build a budget, what are the things that are working that, working that we really need to preserve to make sure our students have that edge. Yes. 
have a question. When we see that as a district, our scores are going down, even slightly, even staying in target, how do we address that? Do, do we say, okay, well, we're still meeting the good score, or do we look at that decline, even if it's just a couple of points, and, and see what we're doing different? When the scores come out, the principals are on that immediately. They have teams that get together, their leadership teams, they're breaking it down, they're looking at item analysis. The Office of Teaching and Learning will start to focus on, again, you know, working with the executive directors, our district coordinators. It really is all hands on deck. And uh, I, again, Lisa, I will share with you as I'm out there working with the schools and we talk about you know, a tough budget, what are those things that we are seeing that are working? And I'll be happy to share you know, with any of you, you know, the schools you represent or certainly the district as a whole you know, to talk about uh, some of those practices. So we're focused on it almost immediately. One of the disappointments we had this year, and I'm sure you experienced this in Boston, usually we have this information in August. This year, when did we receive it? Third week in November? Yeah. So, you know, it's been really difficult this year when you hear me talk about now going out into the schools and really sitting down with the leadership teams. It was difficult to do that beforehand. So it's, yeah. uh, it really put us behind the eight ball. I can also in. answer that question. Um, the principals feel this so strongly. And so I always have to remind myself that they're, if they do well, great, you can joke. There, there's no joking. They get sick over bad scores. So do I say, you know, hey, don't worry about it. Hey, it's okay. Uh, you know, they take it really seriously. And the Office of Teaching and Learning, you know, Eileen and Heather and Julie and Joan, they're, they're all over it. So they agonize <laughs> over, over these tiny little increments. And I can say, you know, look, draw back for a moment. Realize this is a new test. Realize all the things that I just told all of you. They really do take it seriously. It's difficult this year because it, it's this transition year and we got in November. So you, you had to start going in, you know, September. But we're going to be out in the schools. The, the nice thing is when you go out and you hear, the, it's, it's very rare that you have a principal and an instruction leadership team that really is surprised or doesn't quite know what the deal is. The frustrating part is when they know what the deal is, but you can't, you don't have the resources to provide them with what you know and they know works. Because it, it's not like we don't have models here. We made the investment in Huntington, guess what? Huntington improved. But, you know, we have this track record and, and we know what works. So I, I hope that answered your question. It just And just a little bit more, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, the schools develop school improvement plans, um, which Superintendent Smith referenced, that we're actually going to be going out and spending time at the individual schools. Um, there are a lot of formative assessment measures that we actually utilize to talk about how kids are doing. If we're waiting for you know that one assessment at the end of the year, and then that assessment again at the end of the year, PARC or MCAS, whatever we're talking about, um, it, it really is too late. And so looking at those formative assessment measures that we have um, are more important now more than ever. And when schools are building their school improvement plans and when they're talking about what their areas of focus are going to be, those formative measures or what they utilize to really talk about progress and success. So it, it is about this ultimate measure, but it's really all about those other measures in between. The other thing, uh, Ethan, when you mention Eileen, Heather, Julie, Joan, so we're talking about our coordinators at the elementary school for English language arts, um, math and science, and the middle school for English language arts, math and science. You have Dr. Heather Ronan uh, at the uh, elementary for the math and science. Uh, you have Dr. Julie Andrade uh, for the reading English language arts. Uh, Eileen McQuaid is our coordinator of English language arts at the middle school. And Joan Farrington is the coordinator of math and science and also supporting our alternative school. So when we mention those names, two of them are actually Park Fellows throughout the state. Uh, Dr. Ronan and Eileen McQuaid are Park Fellows that sit there, talk about the new standards, really support the district uh, in, in many ways, um, which I'll continue to share with you. Mr. Sullivan? Yeah. Thank you. 
Fabulous. You well did yourself. <laughs> I was just wondering, do you have an overall mark for the district? I do. In other words, what would you rate uh, Rockton Public Schools? <laughs> On a, just a, say a small scale, fair, medium. Out, outperforming its demographic, doing an awful lot with an, a very little, you know, surprisingly holding its own. I, I can't underscore, you can only cut so much for so many years. I'm trying to think back, to, I've been here, this is year 10 or year 11, it, whatever it is, I'm trying to think back to a good budget when we were, you know, adding positions and, and it, it is, so how is the district doing? I think it's doing incredibly well considering the challenges. Brockton doesn't shy, you know, the mayor said this, the superintendent says, we don't shy away from homeless, that, that doesn't matter. You're an English language learner, great. You're going to go here, you're going to do fabulously well. We have the record to, you know, to prove that. How do, I, I do look at how do we compare to the most similar urban districts. There are nine other urban districts in Boston, Springfield, Worcester, Lowland. It's really hard this year because some of them took Park and some of them took MCAS. And some of them who took Park did it all paper and pencil. So how did we do? I don't think this was our best year, but I think under the conditions it was a very, very good year. That's the way I'd say it. Thank you. I'd like to add something to um, you know, talking about educators and, and going around the state. It's almost flipped what we see with growth here in Brockton. It's the growth is trending upward as opposed in Boston, it's very stagnant yep. in other urban districts. So I think that um, we should really celebrate that. And I don't, I know that we do, those of us who pay attention. Um, but I think that the public really needs to, to, to pay more attention to that. And also, when looking at levels, um, I'm in a level three school, and um, I have a friend who teaches at South who got one of my students. And I called him up and I asked how the student was doing. And he said, there's always an adjustment for the students coming from Boston because the workload what we, for what we have in middle schools is heavier. It's, it's more um, rigorous. So going from a level three school to another level three school within the state doesn't mean um, that it's the same school. And I think that when we look at these things as, as parents and, and as educators, we need to understand that too. Um, and it was surprising to me because we're, I you know, take pride in what we're doing. <laughs> but um, to know that we're have, holding our students to a higher standard, it's, it's, it's good to hear. Um, and, and I think that um, we really need to continue to do that. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that, Mr. Gormley. One of the things that really disappointed me, you know, we, we struggle with, with so many things to make sure that our students have opportunities to be competitive, to succeed with, with again, very challenging budgets. And recently, when we received this information, two level one schools with all of the things that we just shared and when I read the article in the local paper and one of the comments was, you know, well, we we're boasting. You know, boasting, you know, that should have been the biggest headline up there when you look at, you know, defying the demographics. And, and again, we continue to look at these challenges. Um, you know, I, I will continue to try to do better. I wish every one of our schools was a level one school and that is our goal. But there's no boasting here. This is the reality of what we're dealing with. And they should have been supporting that as a community. So to say to everybody out there, to the parents that continue to support their youngsters, our teachers, our staff that works hard to make sure that we can meet these challenges head on, we will continue to do that. And let me tell you something, I'm really happy to boast about the hard work that was done by our staff. And again, we'll continue to meet those challenges and uh, I'm, I'm just pleased with the work that's been done. Um, Ethan, I'd like to tell you that I enjoyed your jokes once again. <laughs> I know that um, Mrs. Sullivan did as well. Um, <laughs> you are an acquired taste. The new members will need a little bit of time to, um, ex you know, basically 
get all of your subtle humor, but uh, I think with time you're going to see that they will truly have an appetite for your sense of humor. So um, the presentation was excellent as usual. Um, you know, you, you make it somewhat entertaining for some, you know, very important numbers and statistics. Um, so we certainly appreciate that. Um, and Mr. Cancel is available to Dr. Cancel to any one of you that wants to sit. He is, I thought he did an excellent job, as you said, really teaching us. You know, I go to him all the time to understand these, so don't think that this is easy to understand. I just said to Dr. Tarasi, you know, where do they keep coming up with these additional things as far as looking at formulas? So, you know, he is available if you want to sit with him, make an appointment. I know he'd be more than willing. Don't think that, don't leave here tonight saying, you know, what, what the heck is PPI and CPI and student growth percentile. You know, you'll get it as well as, as we get it. But uh, it is something, again, you're a very good teacher in keeping us all updated. Thank you. Wanted to say I, I appreciate that you were breaking down. It's a bit of an alphabet soup that I think those of us that are new are going to have to uh, get used to, and so I, I appreciate that you were breaking that down for us, and that was that was really helpful. Thank you. Shame that MCAS wasn't around when Mr. Thomas and I were at East. I mean, that certainly would have been a level one school back then. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think so. Dr. Moran was at East also. You oh, well, forward. there you go. See, that, uh, <laughs> we would have, they would have, they would have continued to carry the flag. Taught there, I wow. taught there. See? Don't take all the credit. East is a great place. <laughs> so. Okay, are we all set? Does anyone have any questions from uh, Ms. Barry and uh, Mr. Kinsel? No? All right, well, thank you very much. And that's my report. That's it. Great. Okay. Um, Moving on to um, any unfinished business. Uh, this school committee, I don't think, really started anything yet. So um, yep. the, the best is yet to come. Uh, new business, I, I just guess we need to um, think about picking some dates for the retreat. And could we also mention on the 19th, we are going to be having the parent meeting from 6.30 to 7.30 on the safety and security. Uh, Lieutenant Mills will be there, uh, Principal Rolder, myself, Deputy Superintendent Thomas. Um, we will open it up for some questions. Um, we're going to be advertising it to parents. It'll be very similar to some of the discussion we had at Boston High School, you know, talking about our protocols, how we respond, how we will communicate with parents, those things that we cannot communicate during an emergency. And, and again, it's kind of juggling a, a lot of balls, depending on the situation that's happening. Unfortunately for us, we've had some experience in the past couple of years. So uh, it's a changing time. I look forward to this meeting and inviting the public, uh, but I would like to start the school committee meeting at 7.30 that evening instead of the 7 o'clock, and we'll try to make it an evening. I know we have a presentation from Chartwells uh, that wants to introduce themselves to you, our food service provider, and the Parent Information Center will be doing a report that evening. So we'll keep it to those items. So those meetings will be properly posted with the, with yes. the, di with, with the different times? with the change in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, that's fine. So 6.30 will be the um, security meeting and then the school committee will follow at 7.30. Correct. Which is just a little bit, a little different. Um, okay, we're in. Um, all right, um, do we want to talk about some dates for the um, retreat? Uh, we had talked to our executive team and we had come up with Saturday the 23rd. We would start at about 8.30 in the morning, 8 o'clock, you know, to 8.30, a little bit of networking, um, and we'd get right to it. would be done by noontime, so people don't lose the day. So January 23rd? It is not the holiday weekend. Uh, Martin Luther King, I believe, is the weekend previous to that. All right. Um, anything else under new business? That's it. No? Okay. Um, Mr. Sullivan. Where was that retreat um, going to be held? Here? We, we've had them at the Nissel Room at, um, you know, at Central at 43 Crescent okay. Street. Uh, yeah, I mean, the reason why I think it makes sense to have it at Central is in case there's something that someone needs to obtain or uh, resources that might need to be uh, presented at the uh, retreat. Um, but it will be a posted meeting. Um, again, the public, uh, you know, if they would like to attend, can. There will be signs. Uh, the front door will be open, and there will be uh, signs. Um, 
directing people down the hall uh, to where we are. So uh, if someone wants to attend. Um, in the past, no one has wanted to spend their Saturday mornings with us. I can't believe why they wouldn't, but, you know, they don't. Um, so, yeah, that's usually what we do. And no snow. Let's hope not, yeah. Let's hope we get a little warmer weather. I like December. Um, no need for executive session. Um, so, seeing no further business, um, can I entertain a motion to adjourn from someone? Okay, seconded by Mr. Gormley. All in favor? Aye. Thank you for attending.